You know that sound? That one that you hear and you just wonder, how did they do that? What do they do to get there and how can I do it myself? That's a question I ask myself very frequently. Um, I think it often comes up whether I'm listening to music that I really enjoy or it's just something that I'm trying to emulate, whether it's you know church music or I'm trying to produce a song or something like that. This video is just sort of to document my progress um, and see one, like, can I figure out how people are getting this sound? Um, can I figure out how I can do it myself? And then also can I figure out how to teach it across video and reproduce it? Um, but that's sort of the goal and hopefully uh, you'll join me along this journey as we figure out how do they get that sound? Recently, I've had the question of, how do I get the church snare drum sound? Um, you're probably very familiar with what I'm talking about, but it's in all sorts of tracks, whether it's um, some Bethel tracks, Elevation, Red Rocks even, or maybe some lesser known ones. It's kind of that classic sound um, that you get. And you know, I'll go to smaller churches or try to help out somewhere and they just don't have that sound, whatever it is. Um, and I also find my own drumming whenever I'm setting up for myself. It doesn't quite reach the mark. I'm trying to figure out how to get there and that's what we're gonna do. Thanks for joining me on this journey. And just a little disclaimer is, you know, I'll be learning along the way. So I may say things that are just, I don't know, factually inaccurate, but uh, thank you for joining me in this uh, process. And hopefully we can learn together and I can show you my process for learning. So let's break down my plan for going through this. So the first step will be letting you know some of my prior knowledge, things I've learned over the years or ideas that I might have on how people do it. Um, we'll break that down and then we'll go and we'll look up and do some research, see if we can find anything on YouTube, blogs, things like that to kind of help us um, get there. Step number three will be attempting. We'll try our first couple attempts and see if we can uh, get there on our own, um, see if our research worked and also if the online resources are present for to actually achieve it. Um, step number four will be asking for help. Um, if we can't get there on our own, we'll ask some friends and see if they have any ideas or if they can help us. Lastly, we'll be breaking down um, the results and seeing did we do it, what worked, what didn't, and how you can do it yourself, certainly if I get there. And maybe all I'll come up with is what not to do, but we'll see together. There'll be a timestamp below. If you wanna skip ahead to that last part, then you can do that. But I encourage you to watch uh, my journey as I go through this. We don't know what it'll come to, but appreciate your time. Let's get out of the recording studio and start looking at some of my prior knowledge. What I know of is that people use triggers a lot. I remember watching a video with a guy who played at Upper Room who he was making a joke with triggers and I'll do the same joke here. So clearly they'll get you to the sound you want just about but it seems kind of fake. It seems like cheating and I know that you know, I, I remember watching some stuff about Elevations, live drummers, and they were like, we never use triggers, we only use gates for triggers. Um, now I know that there are some other plugins and things that do gates pretty similar. I know I use um, Silencer by Black Salt Audio, got recommended that and I think that works wonderful, but triggers for the most part um, it is one way to do that. Now you can use Steve Slate for live situations where it kind of does it, so you know, live streams, things like that. Personally, I've never done it, never used them. Seems kind of cheating to me. The second way that I've seen people kind of get this sound is by using the Ludwig Black Beauty. Now, that's a pretty common drum nowadays. I mean, they're pretty expensive. They last I remember, like 700, 800, 900 kind of thing, depending on the size you got. To my knowledge, they're black nickel over brass. And I know that they use some proprietary way of doing it, Ludwig does, and it's supposed to be super special. And I've heard them live and I think they sound great, but honestly, I don't know either how you're supposed to tune it or how they're being processed um, audio-wise 
to get there. Um, I was running sound for a church and the drummer had one of those. He put it in and it didn't sound right. It honestly sounded bad. And I wasn't sure whether it was the way I was processing it from the soundboard or if it was the way that uh, he had it tuned. It was pretty high. It just didn't sound good. I know that the way you mix it, the way you compress it, things like that change the sound of the snare. I know that's pretty obvious, but there has to be some unique way that people are doing it to get that particular sound. Now I know bringing up some of the lows and some of the highs, dipping down some of the mids is a classic way, but I've also heard things like parallel compression, kind of even the sound out a bit. Um, and also making sure that you have a good balance between your top side snare, your bottom side snare, and some of your overheads. Snare reverb, I know is a huge part of that. How they get their snare reverb is probably a big part to the sound. So that's kind of where we're starting off from. We got triggers, we got particular snare drums and hardware, also mixing. All right, so I looked into stuff for maybe about an hour and this is kind of what I came to. So first up, we got this this video, the perfect snare drum for worship music. Kind of watched it, you know, what everyone tried to listen to it. He didn't play it at the end. So I don't really know if it sounded good. So I went into the comments, kind of did a little bit of digging and it turns out that on their little website that they, you know, they have a video of him playing it. So I watched that and that was fine. Uh, it didn't sound exactly what I was thinking it would. Um, yeah, it didn't sound like huge. But again, he used an, a Black Beauty, kind of like I mentioned. He recommended you replace the drum head frequently. Pure sound snare wires, six and a half by 14 was what he recommended. Next one was fat snare drum for worship music, tuning plus mixing. Uh, this video was actually pretty insightful. I'll kind of go through, break down what I learned from it. So again, uh, Ludwig Black Beauty. Again, seems like that's a pretty common thing. He used a Remo Power Stroke P4, Remo Ambassador on the snare side. He said, you gotta use a metal snare and at least six and a half. Um, he said, you gotta muffle it. He uses Evans E-Ring and Moon Gel. The tuning for the top head was 215 Hertz and the bottom head was 400 Hertz. He used this Drum Tune Pro app to get that, so I downloaded that and we can take a look at that uh, later when we try it. Uh, he uses a mallet to kind of hit it. 42 sn strand snare wire, which is pretty expected. Uh, again, kind of what people have been saying. So with the mixing, he uh, did a particular thing, just certain EQs, um, things like that, some key notes from that. He used a Smack Attack plugin, but yeah, it seemed like a pretty standard EQ pattern, I suppose. He did not cut the mids, which I was a little surprised at, but we'll try it out, we'll see what works. He also didn't use the bottom side uh, snare mic or overheads or anything. He didn't mention what mics he uses, so you know, that could probably change mileage per person. I did read the comments and someone said, you can make this sound huge if you use parallel compression or something like that, right? So maybe we'll look into parallel compression and see if we can do that effectively and get a bigger sound. Last one was how to get the Bethel snare drum tone. It was pretty insightful. One of the big things that I got from that was it's a little subjective. He gave a lot of you can if you want, and so made me think that there's multiple ways to get to this sound, and I suppose that's why every sound is a little different. Uh, yeah, he said tabletop on the bottom head. He had die cast hoops, but he also used a Ludwig Black Beauty, so that was a little bit of a different, and that kind of lended to you can if you want sort of um, style. He um, tuned the top a little lower than the other guy, it seemed, but he used a M80 snare muffler, and then he had the same sort of Evans EQ ring. He used lug locks, It wasn't it. It wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Um, and maybe part of that is just perspective and you know budget, things like that. I know elevation, whatever, they're in the studio and or they're live and they have people who are extremely knowledgeable and soundboards that sound really great. So that could be part of it. Uh, next, we're gonna look into some mixing techniques, see if we can see anything outside of just the tuning. So I just did a little research on mixing, what I can do for that, and let's look into it. So the first one I got, how to get that big fat worship drum mix, and that sounded right to me. Clicked on it, it sounded great.
and I was a little disappointed when I saw that it was triggers. So we know kind of what I said before is I don't want to use triggers because that seems like cheating. Now it sounded really great, really perfect, um, and I will leave a link to where this guy got his sounds from. Only thing I just about learned from that is he EQs out 500 hertz from the bottom snare side head. Seemed about the only relevant information to me there. I took a couple looks at some other mixing videos, but they were real long and um, they didn't really specify about drums. Um, learned a little bit about phasing, which is nice. And again, all of these links hopefully will be down in the description. The next part was how to mix live drums, EQ, compression, and gating seemed pretty useful. There are some interesting stats about ratios and drum compression things that maybe we can try to stick to and play around with and see if they work with our sound. I also signed up for a email chain and got an EQ cheat sheet. So this is what it looks like. Um, pretty, pretty simple, normal stuff. Now as a whole, it seemed like our research phase is just about dumb. We kind of have an idea of what we need to do. Um, I won't be buying anything new, and hopefully I have enough to kind of get us to the sound that we're looking for. So um, yeah, let's go and uh, make our attempts, see if we can get it. All right, we're back in the uh, studio here, and um, it's time to take a look and give a try. So uh, we're starting off, um, we've got a Dallas drum. It is their uh, black nickel over brass. It is 14 by eight. So uh, pretty comparable to a Black Beauty. Now, obviously not a Ludwig, but one of the differences that we're seeing right now, it doesn't have that center bead down the middle, um, but also it has die cast hoops. When we, in our research phase, we saw one um, person had that uh, die cast hoop on there. Everyone else had triple flange. So um, that's probably our main difference. All right, so on the bottom, we have 42 strand snare wires. And so, those are gonna be great for us. Uh, work kind of like everyone described. Um, drum head wise on the top, we have a Remo Power Stroke P4. Um, so some people said P77, you know, all sorts of people, P3, P4. Um, this is what I had, so this is what we got. Um, on the bottom here, we have a Evan Snare Side 300. So um, one of the one of the unfortunate things I suppose about right now is I won't get to replace um, all the drum heads. They're not brand new. They're uh, uh, probably too old. So you know, keep that in mind when we go through it. We have our drum throne here, like that uh, video recommended. So it's, it's turny, um, which should be good for the app that was also recommended um, for us to try to tune this thing. So. On this side here on this table, I have some little gadgets and things like the M80 EQ rings. So we'll be able to put those on and see if it works. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Let's tune the bottom head. So it recommended putting a stick underneath the snare wires to get them off the head. So let's do that here. Again, I have it already detuned for us, so we should be all right. And yeah, we'll, we'll finger tighten it, but I'll be using this drum key. Um, it's one of the Tama drum keys, hopefully you can see it there. Um, and it has this nifty little handle on the top. So that's what we'll be using to kind of get a little bit more um, easier finger tightening, but it'll all be with um, this. So we've got it finger tight. Let's try giving it one turn. So it recommended for the bottom side, we wanted to get it to about 400 hertz, okay? So it said one turn around the top, which remember, it's not just one turn, you gotta go around basically twice, right? Um, feels like two turns, but it's not. All right, so let's start. Um, and we're doing kind of a star pattern across the way. Um, So we've given it all one turn, and personally, it feels like one turn is a little too much to start out. I started to feel some of the lugs unevenly loosen, but hopefully that's what our phone will be able to kind of um, mitigate. So let's get a mallet like they recommended so you don't leave marks on your drum head and see if we can get it to about 400 hertz. So we got our drumstick and we'll pull up our app. It's called Drum Tune Pro. That's what he recommended. So I downloaded it and I have the free trial. So it should last for seven days or whatever that they have. So we'll try it. If it works, hey, maybe we'll want to get it more, but uh, let's try it. I'm gonna go on here and select snare drum, flip it over to the resonance side and let's get started. So it, from what I read, it looks like you want to hold it right above the lug and turn the drum rather than the, moving the phone. 
Part of it is the resonance of the room, I imagine, but it's just the way it recommended, so we'll try it. So just going through it, um, it looks like that our drum is too low at the moment. It's getting about 339, which again, like we said, we're shooting for 400, allegedly. So I imagine another half turn should do it. So let's do that. All right, so we've done another half turn, so let's do it. I know some people recommend putting your finger in the center of the drum or muffling it so you isolate each lug. Now, that makes sense to me, and that's what I've done in the past to pitch match, but it looks like the app nor the people on YouTube recommended doing that. So let's give it a try now using the higher tuning. All right, so we went around, um, brought it up a little bit and played around with it. We were hitting about 391 on just about every single lug. So I think I'm gonna stick with that for now. Um, well, we can bring it up later if, if that's what it is, but 391 is what we were at. And so again, probably higher um, than I was expecting, certainly, but I can understand you wanting to bring that up. I know whenever I'm tuning drums, certainly top side higher, you also wanna bring the bottom side. Um, very typical for if you're playing rock music and things like that. I'm a little surprised that we're doing it here in this context, but hey, I'm here for it, I'm learning. All right, let's flip it over and do the top side. We're gonna start with, again, finger tightening. All right, we've got it finger tight, so let's try and do it a half turn like the video recommended. We've given it a half turn. Let's get the phone app out and see what we're at. We're shooting for 215. We've got our mallet again. We got our phone app. Let's give it a try. All right, so we've got it down. Looks like all of them are about 215 and a half. Couldn't get it exact, but hey, we're doing good. Um, so hypothetically, we should be almost there. So um, let's start off and doing what the last video about drums recommended, which was an E-ring and an M80 snare mute. We got our E-ring here. Let's get our snare mute. We'll put that facing towards where the microphone will go. He also recommended lug locks. So we'll put a few on there that have um, some treble tension rods. We got those on there. So now let's get the uh, mics on and we'll put it on the stand. We're gonna be using the overhead microphones and top side and bottom side snare microphones. For the overheads, we have the SR25s by Earthworks and for the snare microphones, we're using the DM20s. We're going to be recording it from a Focusrite to a Mac. Alrighty, let's take a look at some of the uh, processing that I did to achieve this first attempt. So this is what we have on the overheads, just very simple. Didn't compress it or anything. Um, don't think it needed it that much. This is what I have for snare drum. So we have a top, we have the parallel compression, and then we have a bottom side. We have a gate on here. I put this on just because that's kind of what people recommended and you would probably have some sort of gate if we had an actual drum set around to get rid of some of that bleed, but um, put it on there just to kind of get some of the tail end. All right, this is our EQ. So normally I wouldn't do this band right here and probably not this one, um, but I think the room needed it some to get rid of some of that snariness as best we could. Um, now, when we looked at some of the EQ recommendations, let's pull that up. 
So this is kind of what they recommended for snare top. Uh, and this is what they recommended for snare bottom. So it's kind of this, this area here, 100, 150. Um, now in some of our other videos, they recommended to do like boost 180-ish. Um, and so we kind of went with that. Um, they also recommended to boost this area and all of the things that I could found said pretty much cut 500 about. So um, that's what we went with here. We have this cut right here at about 500. Um, one of the videos we looked at that was our tuning recommendation um, said you needed to cut 215. So um, I cut that and I think that that works pretty well because that's where a lot of that real resonance kind of comes from, from the top head. So it, by boosting this 160-ish, it really brings up that like meaty sound of the snare while reducing some of the tone, I suppose, which is what we're kind of looking for. And then this helps the um, the smack or the crack, if you will. So, but it also affects the snare, so I think that's kind of why we're getting some varied results. So um, pretty similar on the bottom in terms of what we're doing, but we didn't cut some of those frequencies up at the top. The parallel compression is also very similar, um, but because it's compressed, more and it has more of that attack and it doesn't have as much sustain to it. Um, I decided to keep some of those other frequencies to be cut from the snary sounds just to kind of um, maintain the integrity of it. So that was my idea. Here's the reverb if you're interested. I've heard that doing uh, EQ on the reverb like this can, can help give it clarity if you're putting it in a busy mix. So that's what I did. Let's listen to just the top side of the snare. Let's listen to the bottom side. That went about as well as you think it would, I suppose. Um, it went fine. Sounded okay. My uh, preference, I think, was the M80 with this uh, the M80 with this ring on. Um, I think that sounded the best, in my opinion. But um, otherwise, it was a little too low when you had the the circle on it is called the big fat snare drum, so imagine it would do that. It seems a bit snary, right? I don't know if you can hear that. Sounds a little different from what some of the recordings were. Now, you know, uh, it sounded good, I think. Um, part of that snariness, I think, is the room. The ceiling up here is not really sound treated. These walls, you know, aren't that great best thing we got is a curtain. Um, so that definitely could be part of it, some of that high end bouncing around in this room. The other thought would be, um, the Scarlet that I'm using to record this does not have that great of, uh, if something's real loud and you're putting it into it, it can't handle that very well. And so in fact, um, the bottom one was starting to be on that edge of, um, kind of clipping through some stuff. It would go red every once in a while. So, um, and I wasn't playing that loud. Um, you know, I wasn't rim shotting, wasn't doing any of that. So I think that would change the attack quite a bit. It would give it that real, you know, crack sound. So um, I think it sounded good. I think it's definitely a good start, probably better than what I've had in the past, but we have to try maybe a different location. Um, again, video won't be as good, but um, we'll try it there. How about? All right, so we're here in the drum cage. Um, we got a Beta 55A on top and an SM57 on the bottom. Um, different environment, let's try it here, let's see what it sounds like. Let's take a look at the attempt number two and what I did there. So I took this file, was originally what we used for our live stream, and I mod modified it some so that we can use it. Alright, so this is the recording we just had, um, let's take a look at snare top. So um, we got in here, we have this gate again, like we normally use for a Sunday, pretty typical. Sometimes we use this silencer plugin, um, but I decided not to use it for the top um, without the compression, just to give it a little bit more um, body to it, I suppose, because sometimes the silencer gates it a ton. So we have a similar EQ to what we had before, again, cutting that 215 and boosting that 150-ish, um, and another boost to that four, thousand so here's our top compression so now let's take a look here at the parallel compression side we have silencer on and this is kind of what it looks like some of the settings but it's basically a, a gate really gets rid of symbols that's its main purpose but we use it for um, a pretty strict gate on the parallel compression because you don't want to compress the symbols um, this is the EQ on that one and then here's the compression 
All right, snare bottom, very similar. We flip the polarity, um, which will, um, if we look at the phase, which is what all the videos kind of recommended you look at, um, you see it's going in reverse. This is going up while this is going down. So when we flip this polarity here, it flips it in there. So it, it's in phase now. Again, gate, EQ, that's very similar. Um, we don't cut as much because we didn't need to. Uh, the snare sound wasn't as bad, um, especially, I, I imagine it has some things to do with the microphone itself. We were using a 57 on the bottom and also it's not as uh, live as the earthworks that we were using. And then there's the uh, compression on the bottom side. Here's the overhead. Um, again, the cage brings some interesting frequencies, and I cut this 215 for the reason of the resonance of the snare drum that we looked at before. Here's the drum reverb. Again, similar sort of thing going on here. But with this one, we also had some mastering effects that I normally use for Sundays, so that could be affecting it some. We have this mastering chain, which has a limiter and things like that on it, so certainly could be affecting the overall sound. Um, but let's take a listen to just the snare top um, group. So that's the snare top with a parallel compression. Remember, I was rim shotting here, so that's part of the reason why that's there. Um, that, that attack, that bite. If you, yeah, let's take a listen to it as a whole. Let's take off the mastering effects and we'll see what it does. Well, I think that had the little bit of sound that we needed and we're looking for. It's not quite there yet, so um, let's ask some friends and see if they can help us. My name's Andrew Pereira. I am a bass player, but I'm also an audio engineer. I don't have any processing on. Uh, right now, I have my plugins disabled. The first thing that I noticed was it didn't sound like there was a whole lot of muting or muffling material that was applied. So no, no moon gels, no big fat snare, or at least it didn't sound that way. And so you get a lot of overtone, which when you think of the more modern um, snare sound, I don't hear a lot of that. Um, I hear kind of a more refined, um, it's, it's beefy. Beefy's kind of the word that I uh, think of. And I think the more overtones you introduce, the further you get away from that. And so that's kind of the first thing I noticed when I pulled it up. I was like, oh, there's a definitive note that's ringing out here that would kind of stick out in a full band context. We can adjust some things and kind of get it more in the ballpark of the, the modern worship snare. I'm gonna go ahead and focus on the snare top. The first thing I have is the Sheps Omni Channel. You can see I have an expression. I have a de-esser, which traditionally you used to tame like harsh frequencies in vocals, or you can use it on electric guitars and this and that. What I kind of, what I was talking about earlier, you can use it in this narrow bell sense where I noticed that snare was resonating at the frequency you had it at. And so let's listen to that real quick. What that's doing is it's basically compressing it, but just at that frequency. And then a more general compressor for the rest of it. I'll play it bypassed and then have it turned on and you can hear the difference. The next thing I have processing on it is an EQ. This is R6 by Waves, or not R6. R6 is a different, um, EQ. This is F6. This is kind of that low end kind of beefiness 
um, of the top head on most snares this is kind of where the low end is going to come in kind of in this 150 120 down to 125 up to 175 somewhere in there is typically where i'm eqing things at for the second frequency like the deesser this is just kind of clamping down on that fundamental frequency that's ringing out and the cool thing about f6 it is a dynamic eq which means there's a compression element that's built in and so you'll see when I play it it is compressing whenever something is triggering this threshold element because I don't want a whole lot of that beef being taken away but I really want to clamp down on that fundamental frequency here I have just some of the mid-range cut out really that's where the boxiness that a lot of people talk about is that and so that's kind of what I'm doing there and then just up here you can see there's just a little bit of sizzle a little bit of um, brightness that I wanted to add in to the top head and we'll get a lot more of that on the snare bottom track I'll a B it here I like to hear the compressor before my EQ just so if there's some character that's being added that is making things worse, that I can kind of tackle that in the EQ section. We can go to the snare bottom, and this is without the Sheps. Now, what you'll see here, and this is on a lot of Wave plugins, is there's a preset. Don't be ashamed to ever use a preset because it can save you a lot of time. And I've tweaked what's in here. So as long as you understand what the presets are doing, don't be ashamed to use them. This is the unprocessed snare bottom. And here it is with the Sheps. So what I have going on here is I've taken out some of the low end with this high pass filter, added a little bit of saturation, have an expander. With a bottom snare mic, you can get a lot of the kick and you can get some of the tom noise. I have some EQ up around 10K. I have this high shelf going on. It's boosting it 60B. So everything above 6K on this shelf is getting boosted 60 B. So it's got a little bit of sizzle to it. And then at seven ish, well over, I have a 4 DB boost. Say that five times fast. That's just adding a little bit of the snares themselves. The top sound is primarily what I'm using for the tone. And this just adds, it makes it sound more like you're standing in front of the kit rather than just hearing isolated microphones. With them together, it sounds like this. The overhead mic that you sent, I'm using it just to give context to the snare, because um, the snare is great all on its own, but it's only part of a very big picture. I didn't do any processing on this. This gives me the context for what the snare top and snare bottom are existing in. This is just a reverb that I just kind of threw on. You'd be remiss if you didn't uh, think about verb on your drums and especially on your snare. While it gets buried fairly deep in some of these more modern tracks, I guarantee that it is for sure part of the big artists um, tracks and even some of the more indie artists, you'll, you'll hear it everywhere. This is the R verb. Mic placement is a big thing. Getting kind of about a half inch to an inch off the rim, kind of aiming towards the center to get that good kind of initial hit, but also that gives you a lot of the low end that you need. You really want is good fundamentals at the source instead of having to do a bunch of processing afterwards. EQ is a finicky thing in a live setting because your room can sound way different than a studio. Or uh, if you don't have a cage or drum shield or baffles or whatever, you might have to process that differently. 
I appreciate your uh, your help and your feedback. Yeah, dude, this is uh, this is always really fun to hop in and problem solve. That's one of the things I love as an audio engineer is um, there's always a problem to solve. Um, and this is a really fun process. I love getting to do this and I love getting to do it with friends. And so, yeah, I'm honored to be uh, part of the process and I'm happy to help. Sweet. Do you have any like so socials or like your website or if like someone wants mixing work done is there any way that they can reach out to you yeah um i think the best touch point for me is now i don't post a whole lot of like actual posts but i post on my story um my instagram is Pereira underscore not underscore panera Sweet. All right. Well, thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. My name is Theodore Cook. I'm the tech director at First Denton. Um, and I also own and operate Starship Studios, um, which is a mobile recording this isn't an ad but this is a it's a mobile recording studio uh based in texas here i've done like anything from release grade singles and albums to people's audition tapes and venue demos whatever i grew up without internet basically and so um we had tons of cds it was mostly early ccm stuff it was you know keith green phil keggy second chapter of axe matthew ward petra um, and like some newer stuff too, like Casting Crowns and Third Day and Modern CCM, Church snare drum sound wasn't as much of a thing back then. Like Petro was trying to do the journey thing, right? And like Keith Green's early stuff was super like dry 70s funk, almost Eagles sonic territory. Casting Crowns is almost more like a country rock band. So is Third Day. That's what I had experience with as like a kid. What we have currently, there's no like consensus about the church snare drum sound, but I think what we were both hearing is pretty much the same that we were after, which is like this, this gushy, like fat snare drum sound that the body of it almost is more important than the attack of it. And so it's still functioning as a backbeat a lot of the time, but it's also pillowy and huge sounding and not in the way at the same time. And so I think that sound evolved out of all the early Christian contemporary music, but it's definitely its own thing that we see in churches like Bethel and Elevation and um, just a lot of drummers and churches that we look up to, you know, and, and think, how do we get that happening? On our own. What do you think of the the audio that attempt one and two, and mm -hmm. um, thoughts about either like yeah the drum specifically or like just other things that you would try to change or stuff like that before? I feel like it was just like not processed enough. Did that mean like compression? Like could have just like hit that harder because I felt like it was a little bit more attacky. And overall, maybe not as loud as it probably would need to be in a mix. That pretty much sums it up. Like tonally though, I saw your EQs like trying to cut out some of his resonances and everything. A lot of that was on point, but I think more on the, could just be bolder with the dynamics processing of those couple attempts. Yeah. yeah. Teddy and I dedicated around four hours to fine tune, record, enjoy some pasta and capture some footage. The resulting sound was Remarkably close to my initial vision, our approach involved lowering the bottom drum head to enhance the resonance while significantly increasing the tension on the top head. To refine our technique, we studied the drum shots in Bethel's Back to Life music video. Particularly, we focused on mic placement. It appeared that they used a Shure 545 SD on the top, while the bottom setup remained unclear. The setup possibly involved an EQ ring and a Power Stroke 3 or 4. During post-processing, Teddy applied a strategic EQ to eliminate frequencies just above the fundamental of the drum, followed by substantial compression. Two reverbs were employed, a short 30 millisecond reverb and a longer one which was then compressed. 
Upon reflection, Teddy noted a potential overemphasis on the fundamental note during the post-processing. Despite this, uh, watching his workflow was incredibly enlightening. Uh, we had about two and a half hours worth of footage. If you want to see the entire process, let me know in the comments. So the first thing I was trying to do is, I mean, people will argue about, should I do EQ before compression or should I do EQ after compression? And the answer to that is what, what does, I guess, if, do you want to compress the EQ signal or do you want to EQ the compressed signal is like one way to put it. So I felt like we needed some EQ going into compression because I wanted to take down some of those low mid resonances before we compress it and brought them up even more. If that's a problem, like trying to get rid of it before you do any other dynamics processing, because that's only going to bring it out. After compression, it, I felt like it didn't need as much in terms of EQ, but I did EQ both before and after compression to get what I was going after. Um, and as far as dialing in that compression, I was really hunting for a certain balance between the attack and the sustain. And I was also looking for a certain shape to the sustain. You know, if you get rid of the attack completely, it's not a drum anymore. But in this case, even with the mic like almost 90 degrees off axis, which should give you a lot more sustain versus, you know, a more, a steeper angle to the drum. Um, I still felt like there was a lot more attack than we needed and not enough sustain. So I was pretty aggressive with compression. I don't really remember, but I think it was like eight, eight to one or 12 to one on the ratio. And then a super fast attack in 1176. I think the fastest attack is 30 microseconds or something, which is really fast. And I think I settled on the fastest release on snare top. And then I processed snare bottom pretty much the same way and was almost using that fader as a brightness control on the sound overall to try to get some, some of that snap back into the sound. After heavy dynamics processing, sometimes you lose some of that clarity and detail. So snare bottom track helped with that. I think with your Earthworks mic, you know, maybe with a little bit more careful dynamics processing that we could have got it to a point where we had the tonal balance we wanted without necessarily needing a snare bottom mic, but I think for sure the number one thing is to get it right at the source. So like, make sure your drums in tune. So like both heads are in tune with themselves, because then you'll have less, less of those like low mid resonances to contend with, and um, make sure your like mic placement is decent. I mean, even going back to heads, you see a lot of churches and schools. Maybe they they aren't prioritizing like the condition that the drum sets in because everybody that plays guitar is gonna bring a guitar and put new strings on it when you need it. And you see you see drums with just like beat to crap heads all over the place. And that's the first place to look. Like if if it doesn't sound at least somewhat close to you in the room, then when you go to slap a bunch of processing on it, it's not gonna, it's not really, you're not gonna be able to get there with the effects. So I guess that'd be my my number one thing. Um, and then the next thing, which is like, which is something I said earlier, was definitely don't be shy with your processing decisions because, um, you know, if you wanna try slamming compression or try super crazy looking drastic EQ curves. Um, if that's if that doesn't work, then that's okay, but you won't know until you try it. So if it seems like it's way off from what you're after, then little like two or three dB adjustments in the EQ isn't gonna make a big change. If you have any questions for me specifically, I guess, you can reach me through the contact page on my website. Just linked. One of the key insights from all of this was the importance of a bold compression. Before I was very reserved, but now I think going forward we'll be able to compress it more and I think that will yield better results. 
Um, before we get to attempt number three, I'd like to mention, I talked to a producer in Dallas and he listened to the sample that I had originally made and he had said that we needed to tune the drum higher. I think now we have all that we need to do this properly. Hey everybody, uh, if you skipped ahead, nice to meet you. We've been on quite the journey. As you can probably see, this video went a lot longer than I thought it was gonna go, but it's been really good. Um, as you probably heard from that first clip, I think we got it. I think we got them. But yeah, it's been great. Now, I don't wanna waste any more of your time, so let's quickly go through what, what this is, what's happening here. So um, on the snare drum, we have a F757, just pointed just like we had with Teddy. Um, at a pretty much a 30, 20 degree angle-ish pointing towards the drum. We have the Power Stroke 4 on top and we have the EQ ring, but we don't have anything else on top of it. Um, the top head is tuned to 296 and the bottom head's tuned to 400. So um, we actually, I actually caved and ended up buying a tune bot. So that was really helpful. Something I found out and something we learned pretty important with Teddy is that compression is kind of the key. Um, I ended up parallel compressing it and doing it that way. Um, with that compression, I kind of realized that you need a good gate. You really have to gate it. And so I used Black Salt Audio Silencer, and that was huge to just removing the cymbals, the hi-hats, things like that from the snare drum because you're compressing it so much. If you don't have a good gate, the cymbals will come through like crazy. So that was big. The other thing that I figured out is um, gated reverb. Now, I didn't know what it was. I just thought, oh, I'll put a gate on a reverb and that might help me control it a bit more. I can have a denser attack. And so turns out that's a thing. It's called gated reverb. So uh, did that. It actually turned out pretty good, I think. I think that was really important. So again, those three things was compression, lots of it, um, a gate that is pretty effective and also gated reverb to me seem to be the key differences that I learned from the initial attempts to the next one. Let's quickly take a look at the drums and what I did to them. So first, this is what I have on the drum bus, just a compressor and a limiter, pretty normal. On the snare bus this is what we have. We have a saturator to kind of get some of the highs. A little bit more interesting. We have a compressor and a limiter as well, just to bring up that snare drum in the mix and give it a little bit more length, but also just kind of let it sit better with the rest of the drums. So here's our parallel compression channel. First we have silencer, then EQ. These frequencies right here, just to get rid of some of the natural ring of the drum, and then we're compressing it a ton and then bringing it up here. With snare top, first we have silencer. Again, more frequencies to just kind of cut out. You'll see that I didn't bring up the high end on here because we're getting most of the high end coming out of the compressed version of the snare. So this is still pretty compressed and bringing it up, but it doesn't have as much um, attack or distortion as the parallel compressed channel. And so it's still pretty short, but it's not doing the heavy lifting for us in terms of the length, and that's gonna come from the reverb. We're just kind of getting a, looking for a tonal quality. You'll see that I actually put a EQ after the compression because I realized that there were some frequencies that just came out a little different, so I wanted to chop them out here. I also have a gate on here just to kind of diminish some of the length that I was getting out of it. Here on the snare bottom, this was actually getting a lot of length to it, which was nice. First we have flipping our polarity. Then we have a gate, not as aggressive as silencer because there wasn't a lot of bleed for the bottom head. And so I actually compressed this a fair amount and we used the makeup button and brought it up because it was getting some good length to it that I wanted to accentuate. And I also brought that out with the reverb. Next on our reverb here, this is the big part, and I found that this was the biggest success. We have a pretty typical room reverb here. We have our decay, it's about two seconds here. We EQ'd it, just to kind of get some of those frequencies out that we also didn't like on the snare drum. I then compressed it, again, brought it up with this makeup here, and then I gated it, which is pretty normal, but it was pretty long, which I didn't want, but I still wanted that dense beginning, and so I probably wouldn't have done it um, almost two seconds but instead I put on a gate and then I EQ'd out this frequency here because I thought that it was becoming a bit of a problem. And then here on our master channel, we just have this um, compressor here that's kind of affecting everything. But again, most of that bus chain stuff is just to kind of let it sit right, get bring out some extra volume. Overall, just 
the biggest thing that I learned is don't be afraid to mess around. I did so much trial and error, and Teddy really showed me that you can't, if you want big things, big changes, you can't make small adjustments. You have to be big with it. That, that was mainly what I learned, and I really hope that's helpful for you guys. So with that in mind, uh, I want to go through a couple things. One, let's take a listen and see where we came from and where we went to. As we wrap up here, I want to note that I'll be putting links to the samples where you can get them if you want them. I'll include a dry and then a processed version. So if you want to try it yourself and take the signal that I use and try to get it to where we are, you can do that yourself. I'll also include presets, so the ADG files that I used in Ableton, put those in there for you to look at as well. Let's listen to everything in context. So we're going to start with the very first snare drum audio that I did and we're going to go all the way through to the end. You're going to see two ones that I hadn't included included yet in this video and they're going to be an attempt that I tried on my own after Teddy um, and then a second attempt where I went over to Teddy's house again and we played around and messed with the higher tuning. So I don't have videos of any of those things but you can listen to the audio and download them if you want. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and coming along this journey with me. I've learned a ton about videography, recording my own voice, and um, even just recording the drums, so it's been great. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this last section. Leave down in the comments which sound was your favorite.